We have two speakers right now. It's a duel, right? So one of them spends way too much time playing retro video games. And the other one spends way too much time automating all the stuff in his life. So now we've got to figure out which one is which. Everyone, please welcome Wes and John. We all know that Wes wrote Pandas. Not, not wrote, but started. <laughs> started. Yeah. But he also put out a blog post in, about, called 10 Things I Hate About Pandas. And that came out in 2017. And we all know there was another Pandas book by Dan Chen that came out in 2017. <laughs> and it's curious timing for when that book would have came out. So I think we need for us to change the author of this book. <laughs> Do you want, you want me to you can cross, cross it out? It out. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, it is our time honor tradition of trolling Wes up here. And we had to come up with more and more creative ways every year. So, <laughs> with that, oh, look, oh, show it to the camera. <laughs> oh, yeah, here it is. That's awesome. Can you zoom in tight on that? That's awesome. Wes, get in there with Dan. Get in there with Dan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, cool. a camera. yeah this is the camera, yeah. Thank you very much for being a good sport, as always. Thank you, sir. Yep. Do, you, do you know how we make this bigger so we can... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, does it go to here? Um, is that good? Do you want bigger? Is that good? Uh, ideally, it'd be great to see the slide, but... Oh, yeah. so that... Wait, can you rearrange this? No. Let me zoom in more. I can zoom in more. Hey, just control plus. Okay. All right. But your notes are over here. Oh, I don't need them. But okay. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Cool. Uh, you don't need anything. Here, this, here. Okay. Cool. All right, folks. Uh, it's great to be back. I think this is like seven or eight years in a row. It all it all uh, runs together uh, through through the years. But uh, it's been a consistent theme in in the last uh, in the last five or six years. Um, you know, we started the we started the Arrow project, and so every year we come back to share uh, how things have things have evolved um, to to make data processing. Um, Faster and easier in R, and to make it easier to work with, uh, work with massive, work with massive data sets. So this year, um, the, the theme is about how how Arrow is evolving as technology to to make R more connected with the broader the broader data ecosystem and the so-called modern data stack. Uh, so we will be sharing some things about some things about that. Um, so co-presenting this year. So uh, I think previous years I was here with Neil, Neil Richardson. Here uh, today with uh, with with John Keane. Um, so I'll just a few words about myself. Uh, I was a co-creator of the co-creator of the Arrow project, um, and have been doing a bunch of a uh, bunch of things in and around Arrow for the last six seven years. Um, started the Pandas project 14 years ago. Haven't been super involved in Pandas in the last nine years. Um, got a book about Python. There's many books about um, about uh, Python for data analysis now. And uh, John. Hi, I'm John Keane. Um, I work as an engineering manager at Voltron Data with Wes, um, and I've worked kind of through my career after academia, switching back and forth between data science and building data science tools. Um, so that's one of the way, reasons I'm super excited to contribute to Apache Arrow. So we, so we started the Arrow project in, in 2000, uh, 2016, and it is, it is involved into its, its current mission, which is to be a multi-language polyglot toolbox for accelerated uh, accelerated data interchange and in-memory in-memory computing. It's grown very fast. We're we're getting closer to the you know 10,000 uh, stars on GitHub uh, mark, whatever that whatever that's supposed to mean. <laughs> and um, but you know we have uh, you know several you know several areas and mantras that, that that we care about. So one is is language independence. Uh, so building a a software framework that can bring value uh, across the the broader. Uh, space of computing, not just a particular programming language. We're building for the hardware agnostic future, being able to use CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, different types of, of hardware to accelerate computing. We want to provide maximum developer flexibility, enabling people to solve the problems where they are, rather than having to bend over backwards to use a, a technology that's, that's an awkward fit for solving the problem that they have. Um, we started with uh, data representation and data and data transport, and that's still a core of, of what we do. It's about interoperability, being able to access and work with very large data sets with almost no overhead. Um, and on, on that, we've, we've moved on uh, to, uh, to building more uh, computing technology for processing uh, the, the, arrow, the arrow memory format. Um, 
so we've been through several iterations of, um, of uh, structures for supporting aero development and, and getting funding and, uh, for, for development, uh, growing the open source community. The project started as an Apache project in 2000, 2016, a large collection of open source projects coming together to develop uh, community supported standards for data frames and for tabular data processing. Um, after a couple of years, um, you know, after a couple of years of development, for me, I was at Cloudera and then Two Sigma. There were many companies that wanted to pour resources into aero development, so we saw an opportunity to create a, a not-for-profit organization, Ursa Labs, uh, to further the mission uh, of aero and aero-native computing uh, without uh, needing to create products and sell things. Uh, so we, we operated as a industry consortium funded by hardware companies, financial firms. Um, we, uh, we were also greatly, uh, greatly sponsored by our studio uh, for, for those, those couple of years. 2020, uh, things became a bit of a whirlwind. We spun out uh, to create a, a startup, Ursa Computing, which is just when John uh, joined, up, joined up with me, um, you know, working to, to bridge the gap between the open source ecosystem and the, and the needs of, of enterprises building on, building on Apache Arrow. Uh, 2021, uh, we saw an opportunity to, to join forces with even more folks from the Aero ecosystem, uh, in particular pioneers from the GPU computing, uh, GPU computing ecosystem uh, to create a unified um, accelerated analytical computing company, uh, which we're calling Voltron Data. Um, the mission, uh, the open source mission of Ursa Labs continues on as Voltron, Voltron Data Labs. Um, and, uh, you know, we continue to, you know, we're now over 100 people and, uh, you know, uh, many of those, you know, several, several dozen of which um, actively work on the Apache Arrow project and the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem around, around Arrow. Uh, so I will hand this over to, to John to talk about what this uh, all means for uh, an R user and how to make, how, how th uh, you know, to make the, what we've been building more concrete in your day-to-day -day work as, a, as an R, R developer. Thanks, Wes. Um, so a bit of a recap. Uh, what does this mean for me as an R user? Like how, how does Arrow help me? And what Arrow, the kind of overarching project, but also Arrow, the R package lets you do, is it unlocks a bunch of abilities to read large amounts of data um, quickly and even use query engines that rely on the Arrow format and Arrow interchange. So a couple of concrete things you can do with the Arrow R package is you can read and write Parquet files. Um, you can query large multi-file data sets that don't typically fit to memory. Um, you can write and repartition those data sets efficiently. Uh, and you can also read data from cloud storage and many other things. And I will show you a lot about the data sets uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so this sounds cool. How do I get it? Uh, we've been on CRAN for a few years now, so you can install that package as Arrow. Um, if you want to get the kind of bleeding edge dev version, um, and you already have Arrow installed, we have this helper function that lets you get a, a bleeding edge version that we build nightly with install underscore Arrow nightly equals true. Um, and then there are URLs for docs there, which have helpful introductions as well as uh, things that can be helpful when you're getting started. And if you run those commands and it doesn't, if you run those commands and it doesn't work, please tell us because we will fix it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and we have a huge amount of CI testing all of that. So if you do that, we might ask you, do you have a Docker image that we could put into our CI? But we will do that and make sure that it doesn't break again. Um, so the R, or sorry, the, the Arrow um, project and ecosystem has seen kind of huge growth uh, since it started. Um, we see increases in users, contributors, applications that use it. Um, we had our eighth major uh, release this past May. Um, we have over 75,000 uh, downloads per month of the Arrow R package, and that's actually only one CRAN mirror, the one that has logs from our studio. Um, we have over 50 million Pi Arrow downloads. Um, something I probably should have put up here as well, uh, but Wes reminded me about this uh, last night. Another kind of facet of a healthy ecosystem for an open source package is seeing the number of contributors over time. And just like these, the number of unique contributors to Apache Aero is increasing. So not only are we developing more code, we're also developing the community around that code so that that community can maintain the code going forward. 
So if anybody uh, joined virtually last September, uh, Wes gave the kind of annual update. Um, and since then, we've had a huge amount of activity both in the core Aero project, but also bringing that stuff into the Aero R package. Um, so since that update, which was less than a year ago, uh, it was in September, we've implemented joins for Aero dataset queries, um, a number of date functionalities, many of them mirroring the Lubridate functions, as well as some base R uh, date manipulation functions. We have a kind of experimental setup for extension classes for new types, and I'll talk about that one very cool use of that in a little bit. Um, and there have been a bunch of quality of life improvements around data sets. So things like making it easier to write data sets with exactly the right types of uh, settings that work with your data. And of course, everyone's favorite, uh, we gained the ability to write CSVs. We've been able to read CSVs for a while, but we never wired up the writing feature. So uh, you can write CV CSVs. Um, so looking at what we did uh, last year, um, we start off with a data set. So you do standard uh, library arrow, library dplyr, because uh, we'll be using the, the dplyr syntax in querying arrow data sets. Um, so this data set right here, um, I downloaded to my local computer, and all of these timings that I'm going to give you are from that, that MacBook. It's not an impressive MacBook. It even has 16 gigabytes of RAM, so not even the max RAM you can get. Um, nevertheless, all of these timings and queries that I'll go through are from that. Um, this data set itself is the New York Taxi data set uh, from 2009 to 2022. Um, and so once you open the data set, you have this data set object, and you can do things like figure out how many rows there are. Um, and so here, this is about 1.7 billion rows in this data set. Uh, on disk, these are saved as parquet files. Uh, and it's 68 gigabytes of parquet files. And the parquet files are actually compressed, so if you were to attempt to load that into memory, you would need even more than 68 gigs. Uh, and I think we all know that 68 is larger than 16, so there's just no way I could open this data set and process it in R in memory. And that's what Arrow will let us do. Uh, so opening the data set, uh, all it's doing is scanning the headers of the parquet files. As so this is super, super fast. It's like 0 .06 seconds to open the data set. Um, it's read some data so that we know what's in the data set, we know how many rows there are, uh, but it hasn't actually processed any of the data. And this data is all available at this S3 bucket. Uh, so if you want to download it and try it, you can. Awesome, so we've opened our data set. Now, what do we want to do? So this right here is, is a pretty bog standard uh, dplyr pipeline. And something I, I uh, kind of joke about when I give presentations about Arrow and using the dplyr interface is, if you know dplyr, this presentation should be stupidly boring. Because you're like, this is just dplyr. You don't need to teach me filter. Um, and we put a lot of work in crafting the Arrow, the Arrow package to use all of the same dplyr idioms and make sure that everything just works like it should, that way you don't have to learn a new uh, data manipulation framework or uh, syntax. You can just use what you know from dplyr and operate on these giant data sets. So here we're looking at kind of, we want to get an aggregate based on the pickup zone for taxi trips. Uh, what are the means for things like um, total ride amount and tip and stuff like that? So we start off with very standard dplyr verbs, right? We have a filter, and then we group by the zone, we summarize with uh, mean functions, um, and then we filter again to say, I only want the, the zones that had more than 500 uh, pickups. And the only thing that is slightly different, um, and you'll be familiar with this if you use any dbplyr, is we have to do a collect here at the end. Because what we do in Arrow when you're specifying the the dplyr pipeline, it's not actually calculating th anything. It's just kind of setting up a query plan, and then that collect says, OK, now Arrow, go run this query and give me the results. Um, and here we have the results. And the amazing thing here is that this took just about 10 seconds. And again, on my MacBook, it's not some cluster somewhere. We processed that uh, billions of rows in 10 seconds to get an answer like this. There was, I didn't even try to do this, because I knew that uh, R would just crash. but effectively impossible before. And, th and this right here is everything that you basically could do last September. So what can you do now? Um, so one of the features that we added are joins. So this data, the uh, pickup zone ID is a pretty useless indicator for a human. Like, I don't know what zone 1 is or zone 28. 
Um, but there is a helpful file that gives you what the zone lookups are in a CSV. And so what we can do is we can load that file as a second uh, data set that we call zones. We have our same query here where we filter group by summarize. And then at the end, we just do a left join on that zone lookup. And so it says, give me you know, the zone IDs and match it so that we can get nice human readable zones. And it turns out zone one is Newark, uh, which is a little surprising for New York City taxi data, but I guess you have the outliers at the beginning. And again, uh, this is super quick. This is a bit, a bit cheating. It says seven seconds. I ran it right after I ran that other query. So some of those Parquet files are kind of in disk cache. Uh, but even running this separately without running that first query uh, will be on the order of 10 or 11 seconds. We also implemented date time functionality, like I said. And these you can just insert into these pipelines like you would. Um, so this is a, a same pipeline, but I want to look at by quarter. Let's group by quarter, year, and zone. Um, and here I just tossed in the lubricate quarter function. And what this is doing is there's actually a, a kind of wrapping or a binding um, that takes quarter and then turns that into the expressions that Arrow can use operating on the native Arrow uh, query and native Arrow data. It's not pulling it into R and using lubridate's quarter, but it's using an implement implementation in Arrow's query engine, which means that it's super fast. And this query here took 12 seconds. And again, we're querying billions of rows on a laptop, and we get an answer in 12 seconds. So uh, kind of stepping outside of uh, just looking at deep layer queries, um, one of the great things about the Arrow uh, format is that it's a memory format that is standardized, and you can use it across languages or across packages. And that standardization makes it so that different uh, packages, different languages can all access the same memory without ever having to kind of re-serialize it or save it to disk or save it to a CSV and then read it back in. Um, and that unlocks a bunch of really cool functionality. So one of the packages that has implemented this um, is DuckDB, which is an in-process uh, SQL database. Um, they also have an R package. Um, and the cool thing is you can start out with an Arrow data set, um, do some filtering, standard dplyr stuff, and then if you add this to DuckDB uh, verb, what it does is it, set, it passes to DuckDB a pointer to the Arrow data set, or actually the query that will be run against the Arrow data set. Um, and then from that point on, you're actually interacting with a, a tibble or a lazy tibble. Um, and so you can just do standard dplyr or dbplyr uh, functionality after that. Um, and the cool thing is here, we're not actually passing, we're not actually translating the data at that point. We're just saying, hey, DuckDB, when you run this query, look for this data here. And DuckDB can read the arrow memory directly. Um, and there is. Nearly zero transformation to go from the arrow format into the, the kind of native DuckDB format that it processes on. Um, and so this is super quick. Uh, this is, took 11 seconds. Um, and this query is the same one that we did at first. And so you can see it took 10 seconds the first time and 11 seconds here. So we're not actually paying a penalty from going from arrow to DuckDB uh, because of that arrow memory interchange. Um, I'm going to. Well, this, this one is quick. So you, not only can you go uh, to DuckDB, you can also come back into Arrow. So if you had a function that you could only do in DuckDB or you had some, some custom data in DuckDB, you could do to DuckDB, do some dplyr, and then do to Arrow. And what that does is it registers the uh, DuckDB result as um, something that Arrow can operate on. And you can continue on. So here we're doing that lift join after, after the fact. And we get results like that. And again, this is 10 seconds. So we're not even paying a penalty. We're now you know, going back and forth twice. Um, if we were having to write this to disk, uh, it would just take forever. But because we're just passing the pointer to the memory reference around, uh, there's no penalty for doing that. Um, you can also write pure SQL. Um, so if you alter that to DuckDB call to give it a table name and you pass in a connection, uh, you can then just reference that table in a standard SQL uh, query like this if you prefer SQL over dplyr. 
Um, another really cool thing, and this is a work in progress, it's not yet on CRAN, um, but a colleague of ours, Dewey Dunnington, has been working on this package called GeoArrow, which extends the Arrow memory spec and also a, a spec for writing geodata on, in Parquet files, um, but using Arrow under the hood. Um, and it's super awesome. So this uh, also is showing the, um, referencing an S3 bucket with data in it. Uh, and this data set has 9.4 million rows. Um, and with GeoArrow, you can filter that. And again, this actually isn't even downloading all the data first. It's just referencing it in S3. Um, it takes about five seconds to read the headers of the files on S3, and then five seconds for this query. And you get back GeoData. Um, this is like well-known binary format. But you can then take that and use it in SF or plotting, uh, which is really fantastic. Um, Yes, and you can install this uh, with install underscore GitHub. Uh, it'll be on CRAN soon, but we don't know quite when yet. So if you want to know more, uh, we recently released in our cheat sheet. Uh, and so this is up on our web page, um, which is fantastic. It kind of gets you started and gets you working. There's also a cookbook for R and a bunch of other languages that Arrow supports that have recipes for common workflows. Um, both of those are really fantastic. So what's next? Um, we're going to continue working on um, this project called Substrate, which we talked a little bit about last year. Didn't talk so much here. But what that's doing is it's taking the kind of deep layer syntax and turning it into an intermediate representation um, that's standardized across engines, uh, which will unlock a bunch of features, being able to send different queries to different engines. Um, and that's a separate open source project, but something that we are working with folks there um, and driving development on. We also plan to have uh, window functions, um, which will be coming up soon. And there are a number of performance and efficiency improvements. And one last thing. Uh, Neil told me, he's been told by multiple people, that uh, Arrow is not actually a real R package, because we didn't have a hex sticker. But I am here to tell you we have a hex sticker. Uh, I have a bunch of them. I'll go put them up on the table. Uh, and huge thanks to Danielle Navarro, who designed this. That was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. I've been asking for this GeoArrow stuff for a while, so I'm glad all of my in-person feature requests have come to fruition. <laughs> yes. And that is the beauty of open source, right? You want something, you ask nicely, and odds are you're going to get it. Yeah, I've had lots of feature requests I've put in just like asking very nicely, either in person or on GitHub, and they come through. So that's great. So I'm very, I am personally very excited about that. Um, so that was awesome.